Susah hati, senang hati 
Good morning, church. Welcome everyone to our online service. I trust that it's going to be a service that is going to bless your heart. You know, oftentimes people will walk away from a service and some will come to me and say that, what a great service, the word really spoke to my heart. And some people will come to me and say, ah, you know, I don't know, there's not so much about the service. You know, the Bible, Jesus tell a parable to address that. Uh, Jesus tell the parable of the sower and the seed. And he talk about a sower that went around and sowing seed and he fall into four different kind of ground. One by the roadside, one on the thorny ground, one on the hard ground. But the last one, he said, fell on the good ground. And he says that when the seed falls on the good ground, it produces a hundredfold, 30, 60 fold, and a hundredfold of fruits. I want you to know that if we were to prepare our hearts, then that heart of ours will be that good ground that to receive the Word of God. Let me give you a story. About three weeks ago, I shared a message about leaning towards the supernatural. And uh, right after the service, and uh, two weeks later, uh, we, I, I had a conversation with Alpha and Siska. They kind of text me. And it was a story about the mother, uh, Alpha's mom, who is uh, admitted to hospital. And this is the story. Let me read to you, and I'm sure it will encourage you. Uh, ever since Pastor Steve messaged to remind us to lean towards the supernatural, we have been more intentional to do so. The recent stories was my mom who fell sick due to a new new more thorax, okay? Oxygen level is low, admitted to hospital, which raised another concern of COVID, especially for uh, my mom. Uh, her age right now is 72 years old. The last time she was admitted due to the same uh, scenario or same problem, it took her 10 good days to be discharged and a good season to actually recover. We were very concerned. But God is so good. When we lean towards the supernatural, uh, she recovered speedily. By the third day, the doctor gave signal that she can actually go back. On the fifth day, the doctor confirmed that she went back and she is doing extremely well. And not just the, the speed of recovery, even the finance, the bill, God provided a supernatural way uh, to cover for the bill. Uh, we realised that when we lean towards the supernatural, we learn to trust God more, we learn to believe God more, and we get to see the hand of God move in our life. So I want to encourage you, let's lean towards the supernatural today as we begin the service. I'm going to pray a quick prayer for you. Dear God, I come before you, I pray for every one of us that is going to join the service. I pray that the seed, that the Word of God will sow into good ground, that it will produce 30, 60, 100 fold. Help us to receive the Word and be fruitful and believe for the supernatural to happen in our lives and through our lives. In Jesus' name, Amen. Yo, welcome to our Every Nation Church Malaysia's online service experience. So glad that you can join us today. Do follow us on our Facebook or subscribe to our YouTube channel at Every Nation Church Malaysia to be updated with our latest uploads, videos and posts. That way you can be most in touch with whatever we are doing as a church. Now we have a quick video for you to watch. Do enjoy. Now, if this is your first time joining us, we really want to welcome you. But more than just that, we've got a special gift just for you. All you got to do is scan this QR code and claim your free gift. Again, if this is your first time, we've got a special gift made just for you. Don't miss out. Now, we are about to enter into an awesome time of worship. And I'm believing that if there was any word to define our session later, it would be the word supernatural. So whether you're watching this with your family, with your friends online, or even watching it alone, I want to encourage all of us to open our hearts to be ministered by the words of this song. 
But more than just that, I want us to respond in worship. If you're watching with your family, do gather them around, stand on your feet and worship out loud together. If you're watching it with your friends online, well, you could write down whatever words that ministers to your heart during worship at the comment section. If you're watching it alone, I do want to invite you to respond together by singing along. The bottom line is this, I'm believing that today's worship session will be a supernatural time. And I want us to contend for that. Now let's pray. Father God, I'm believing for the supernatural during our worship session. I'm believing that we will as a church declare your glory across the nations and talk about your marvelous deeds to all the people. I'm believing for miracles to happen even during our worship. I'm believing God for broken hearts to be restored, for the sick to find healing, for those who are lost to return and be found. God, I'm believing for a supernatural encounter. We welcome you into our midst. Move within our midst as we worship you. You deserve all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. Welcome to Every Nation Church, Malaysia. Why don't we all get off our seats right now and give God the praise and worship that He deserves this morning. Come on. Our God, a firm foundation, our rock, the only solid ground. As nation rise and fall, One strong now shaking For we trust forever in your name The name of Jesus Come on, let's sing it out We trust the name of Jesus You are the only King forever Almighty God, we lift you higher You are the only King forever Forevermore you are victorious, you are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious. Hey, come on. Can you need to praise the Lord this morning? I'll match in all your wisdom. Come on, here we go. In love and justice you will reign Where every knee will bow We bring our expectation For our hope is anchored in your name The name of Jesus Come on, declare it We trust the name of Jesus Almighty God, we lift you higher You are the only King forever Forevermore, you are victorious You are the only King forever Almighty God, we lift you higher You are the only King forever Forevermore, you are victorious Yes, God, and you will always be. You will always be victorious, God. And with you, all things are possible. Hey! We lift our banner high. We lift the name of Jesus. From age to age, you reign. Your kingdom has no end. We lift our banner high. We lift the name of Jesus. From age to age you reign Your kingdom has the way Sing it again We lift our banner high We lift the name of Jesus From age to age you reign Your kingdom has the way We lift our banner high We lift the name of Jesus From age to age you your kingdom has the way You are the only king forever Almighty God, we lift you higher You are the only king forever Forevermore, you are victorious 
Papa, just want to thank you for this time. Where God, we can come together this morning, not as individuals, but God, a spiritual family, a family that can come and worship you despite of this pandemic situation. And as always, God, you are our desire. And this morning, we want to take this opportunity to confess that. One thing I desire One thing I seek Is to gaze upon your beauty Your majesty God of my salvation Lifter of my head Teach me how to live, O oh Lord Your righteousness So I pray to you so I pray so I pray to you Lord your name is higher than the heavens Lord your name is higher than all created things higher than hope Higher than dreams The name of the Lord Come on, let's worship Him In the day of trouble You cover me
Jesus. Come on with all our hearts. Come on, let's worship the Lord. I will seek your face.
Father God, we thank you for the powerful time of worship. We thank you that your presence is indeed moving in our midst. And God, even as we move on to the next section of the service, Holy Spirit, you continue to minister into our hearts, touch us, speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, we are going to return back to our series called Once Upon a Time. It's a great series and today we are really honoured to have Pastor Balan to talk about the part two of this series to us. And I want all of us to open our ears, open our hearts and prepare to be ministered by Pastor Balan. All yours. Good morning, church, and welcome to our online service. Uh, it's an honour and a privilege for me to bring the word this morning. But before we start, can you just click the like button, the thumbs up button, if you had an MCO haircut, maybe a family member, a wife, cut your hair, click the like button. If you had cooked a new recipe this week, all right, you tried something new, can you click the heart button for me? And finally, if today is Sunday and you are dressed up, you know, usually you just wear shorts around the house, but today, even though you're at home, you are dressed up, you're wearing pants, okay, or, or you're wearing a dress, uh, click the ha 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 button for me. Excellent, thank you for doing that. You know, one of the things that I miss most about church is the interaction between us, right, about a spiritual family. It's one of the best ways that you can um, interact with this service is hitting the like button, putting comments in the comment section. And we're in this series called Once Upon a Time, life-changing stories that Jesus told. And we are picking the parables that Jesus told. What are parables? Parables are earthly stories with a heavenly meaning. You know, Jesus uh, told stories, they told lots of them, and he always used it to illustrate a message they wanted to bring. Uh, it was last two weeks ago, yeah, Eugene brought uh, the first parable, he talked about the man who built on the rock versus the man who built on uh, sand. And he was talking about where are we building our foundation? Are we building it on the Word of God? And today, uh, we are going to t look at the next parable, which is the parable of the rich fool. Let me ask you something. How many of you want to be rich? Click the like button. How many of you want to make so much money that you can fund uh, amazing projects and change the world? Click the like button right now. Wow. Uh, do I sound like the, one of those online gurus that you see on Facebook? And, um, you know, finance is the, the topic or the, the message today. It's about wealth and what is true wealth. And I'm sure that's something that matters to a lot of us. And, uh, you know, today they are uh, people taking advantage of the situation of people, you know, looking, they, they, they have an anxious, they are, have anxiety about the future. And, um, you know, recently, uh, even Facebook had uh, put up bans on online uh, wealth gurus, apparently. So um, it's, it's something that we look, see in the headlines of newspapers, you know, economy, uh, warning us about what the future brings. So it's, it's really a time where money and finances and wealth uh, is, is prominent on, the, on, the, on people's minds. And it's not, nothing new. This has been a topic uh, over the ages, right? And, and Jesus himself uh, talks about finances a lot. So today we're going to look at the rich fool. And I'm just going to set it up for us. Uh, it says in Luke chapter 12, verse 1, it says that in the meantime, there were so many thousands of the people had gathered together that they were trampling one another. So Jesus is at a meeting. He is teaching. And there's so many people there, thousands, so much so that Scripture says they were trampling on one another. And while he was teaching, suddenly out of the crowd, a man stays up, stands up and he says this to Jesus. Teacher, Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But Jesus said to him, Man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? Now imagine that you're in a sold out meeting. It's a, it's a massive conference. Thousands are there. Jesus is the speaker. And then suddenly, a man stands up and asks Jesus to uh, arbitrate, you know, uh, to mediate between him and his brother over some personal uh, matters, you know, over a will, over some inheritance. Uh, you can tell that this man was probably in 
he was probably frustrated. He was probably uh, um, angry. And, and he wanted someone to solve uh, his, his problem at that time. And this is what triggers the parable of the rich fool. Jesus didn't immediately answer the man. He didn't solve the man's problem. Instead, what he does is he talks about the heart of the issue. Verse 15, Jesus said to them, Take care, be on guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist of the abundance of his possession. So when Jesus gets this uh, demand from this man, he doesn't solve the man's problem, but he looks at the heart of the issue and he says the heart of the issue is covetousness. And he says the heart of the issue is the wrong definition of what life is, right? He says, and he tells us to be on guard. Be on guard against all covetousness. In other translations, it says, be on guard. Beware of greed. The, the Passion Translation says this, for, you, for your life can never be measured by the amount of things that you possess. Now, I don't know about you, but this is a common interpretation of what life means for many of us, right? If we have all the material wealth, if we have the things that we want, um, uh, material things, cars, houses, phones, clothes, um, condos, uh, trips, travels, all these things, we would say, this is the life. But Jesus changes our pers perspective on you know, what is really life. And he begins to say, look, the abundance of possessions, the amount of valuables that you have, does not determine how valuable you are. Let me say that again. The amount of valuables you have does not determine how valuable you are. And the word life that Jesus uses here is the word Zoe. And it is the complete kind of life, the God kind of life. John 3.16 says, um, whoever believes in Him, believes in Jesus, shall not perish but have eternal life. That word eternal life is the word Zoe. So here Jesus is saying, life, your Zoe life, your complete kind of life is not attained by having lots and lots of things. Uh, there are other words, Greek words that are used in the Bible. Uh, the other words are bios, that's talking about where we get the word biology, right? Talking about your physical life. The other word is suki, where we get the word psyche from, right? Talking about our soul, usually it's translated as a soul um, and in the Bible and often it's also used life. So Jesus is saying this, not your bios life, not your suki life, but your eternal life, your God kind of life is not earned by lots of possession. And um, then he begins to illustrate what it means to have an abundant life and, and he illustrate what it means to beware of covetousness. So Luke chapter 12, verse 16, and he told a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentiful, and he thought to himself, what shall I do, for I have nowhere to store my crops? And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grains and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. So Jesus tells a parable. He says, you know, there's a rich man. So this guy's already rich. More than that, he's going to get richer, right? His harvest has produced a plentiful, the word says. So much so that he has no place to put his harvest. He begins to say to himself, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to uh, store this access that I have. I'm going to store it. And, and, he say, and he speaks to his soul, the word said. He speaks to his soul. He speaks to his uh, suki, his psyche. And he says, you know what? Soul, you've made it. You know, now you have attained life. You have an abundance, right? So this is what we're going to do. We're going to chill, we're going to relax, and we're going to consume everything that we have made. The plot twist is, God says to this man, 
full this night. Your soul is required of you. You know, Jesus reminds us that God is the master of our life on earth. Jesus brings back the urgency that, hey, now is not the time to relax. Now is not the time to uh, rest on your laurels. Now is not the time to consume for yourself. Because you know what? God can come at any time and require your life. And then, what will you have before Him? What will you do when you stand before the King of Kings, the Creator of the heavens of the earth? Will you tell Him that, God, I made all this money and I consume it for myself? That's the answer you want to give to God when you stand before Him in the future. So Jesus brings in this sense of urgency about uh, the times that we're living in and the def- how should we define what life is. God calls this rich man a fool. And he says that he's a fool because firstly, he misunderstood who is master of his life. He assumed the length of his life. And secondly, he's a fool because he collected all these things to be consumed by himself. He wasn't rich towards God. And the thing is, God is not against wealth. You know, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18, he, he says this, You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you power to get wealth. Throughout the Bible, there are many wealthy men that we uh, look at, right? Um, King Solomon, he was the richest man of his time. Even by today's standard, he would be one of the richest men. Uh, Abraham was wealthy. Uh, Isaac, Jacob, they were all wealthy. Job was wealthy. God is not against wealth. Right? But what he is against, what Jesus is speaking to, is greed and covetousness. And Jesus knows what he's talking about, you know, when he's talking about covetousness. Um, he was tempted by covetousness, so he understands the urge, the temptation of um, having things and being wealthy and, and, and defining yourself by uh, having valuables, right? Because Luke chapter 4 Satan himself comes to tempt Jesus. And one of his temptations was he, br- he brings Jesus to on top of the mountain. And uh, the devil reveals to him all the kingdoms, all the empires of the, the earth and their glory. So he would have showed him all these kingdoms and all their treasures and all their, their horses and all their men. And he tells Jesus, he tempts him, look, all this, Jesus, will be yours if you bow and worship me. So Jesus knows what it's like to be tempted when he is teaching us about covetousness. It is something that he has encountered himself. And potentially, uh, Jesus has uh, temptations of covetousness that we don't even know about. Uh, One time Jesus went to pay his tax. All he had to do was get uh, ask Peter to uh, fish For a fish, get a fish, and from the fish, he finds a coin in the mouth. So Jesus probably had all kinds of uh, access to wealth that he could have had, but he didn't use, right? He could pull tax money from a fish. So Jesus knows what it's like to be tempted by valuables, by things. That's why we should uh, listen to him. And he begins to give us what is the antidote to greed. Uh, the great thing about parables is Jesus always explains what the parables mean. So you don't have to kind of uh, symbolistically interpret the meanings of the different parables because all, if not most, of the parables, Jesus always explains what it means. And uh, in this parable, thank God, he explains it for us. In uh, Luke chapter 12, verse 22, what is the antidote for greed? He said to his disciple, therefore I tell you, you know, uh, that word therefore means in conclusion. Okay, so he tells the parable about the rich fool and he says, in conclusion, do not be anxious about your life or what you will eat, nor about your body or what you will put on. For a life, right? This Zoe kind of life, this eternal life, this God kind of life. It's more than food. It's more than body. And the body, more than clothing. 
Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. How much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And then you are not able to do a small thing as that. Why are you anxious about the rest? Jesus begins to point his listeners. Oh, in fact, he turns to his disciples. He tells this parable to everybody, but he begins to explain the meaning to his disciples, right? He says, therefore, firstly, he tells them, you know, the antidote to greed is recognizing how valuable you are to God. How do we recognize how valuable we are to God? He says, consider. And he uses, consider the birds, right? He's saying, look, they're probably out in a field somewhere. And um, this is something familiar with everybody. And even today, you know, we have birds outside. And he says, look at those birds. Do they, like, worry about where the next meal is coming from? And doesn't God feed them? Don't you think you are more valuable than birds? And he says, why are you worried about what you're going to eat? And he says, look at the grass and look at the flowers. Aren't they beautiful? Consider those things. If God clothed them, made them beautiful, won't he clothe you as well? So the antidote for greed, the first one, is to consider. And Jesus contrasts it, consider and worry. He says, don't be anxious, instead consider. Now, here's the thing about considering and worry. They both trigger your imagination. You know, when we worry, we are imagining uh, things in the future that, and it, it triggers fear in our lives, right? When we worry, we're thinking, what if, what if, what if, what if this happens? What if this happens? What if this happens? Oh no, what am I going to do? But when we start to consider nature and how God takes care of um, things in creation and we recognize how valuable we are, we shift from a mindset of what if, what if, what if that leads to fear and we go to a place of faith. So when we consider, we are reflecting on who we are to God. We are reflecting on how valuable we are to God and it releases faith in us. You know, nothing, if you want to be creative during this time, you know, a lot of the um, uh, marketplace is talking about pivoting, talking about uh, repositioning yourself, talking about uh, innovation, uh, crisis. And one of the best ways to activate creativity in your life is faith, right? Faith releases creativity because you have hope. You know, you look at the future and you can imagine solutions to your problem, right? And so when we start to activate faith in our lives, we move forward to, through our trials, through our circumstances, through our challenges, with a sense of hope and it releases creativity. On the uh, opposite end of that is when we worry, we start to shrink back. Right? All we see are the problems and, and it's, it, it triggers the limbic uh, side of the, the brain and it causes us to uh, sometimes be paralyzed. You know? That's where they call, talk about paralyzed with fear. But when we apply considering how valuable we are in Christ, it creates a fruit of faith and faith will help us to meet uh, this season in creativity and resilience because we know how valuable we are to God and we recognize how powerful He is and He is able to intervene no matter what circumstances you are going through in this season of your life. You know, I've seen how God has provided um, personally. I've seen it in my family's life. Uh, um, I'm going to show you a picture. This is a picture of Barrio. It's the picture of my parents' generation. Uh, this is the late 1960s, early 1970s. And, and here you have children, maybe primary four, uh, primary three, primary five, and these are some of my uncles and aunties. And this was their life. Yeah, they lived in a place called Barrio. It's in Sarawa. It's in the highlands. You know, even today, the main way to get to Barrio is by flying a twin otter plane, right? Or you 
can take uh, the logging road and uh, you use a, a pickup truck to get there. It's, it's, it's highly inaccessible. And if you look at this picture, they're all barefoot. Okay? So I want you to understand where my heritage comes from. Um, we, my parents did not uh, come from you know, wealth, uh, wealthy places. In fact, um, this picture, you know, this is uh, the school, uh, primary school kids. My dad had to walk hours to the boarding school. Okay, so on Sunday, he would leave his home, walk with friends hours to the boarding school, and then on Friday, return back home, walk hours barefoot through the jungle to where they live. That's the kind of life that uh, my parents grew up in. And yet, God took care of them, you know, from a place of such remoteness. And I can tell you, growing up, I've never had lack. You know, more than lack, you know, uh, we as a family, we've lived overseas. We lived in New Zealand for, uh, for three years. We as a family, we've, uh, you know, I've, I'm, I've been educated uh, in, in tertiary education. My, my sister as well, my, my brother decided not to. Instead, he, he went to Australia and got a uh, fitness training certification. So we, we got our education. Um, we, you know, I've, growing up, you know, I've had uh, things. I've had stuff, PlayStation, electric guitars, uh, cars, whatever, you know. So, but God has been so faithful to my family, if you look at where they came from and how far they've come, you can see the hand of God. It's only God who can do that. So I want to encourage you, if, if God can take care, can bless a community like the Kalabits, uh, take them from uh, where they were to where they are today, He is continuing. He can do that for your family. Right? Maybe uh, years from now, your children's children uh, or your children will show a picture of your house or your life and, and they will look back, man. Uh, and they will probably say something like, oh, look how, you know, how much lack we had or whatever and look where we are now. Um, but God sees you and He's faithful to you and you are valuable to Him. Okay? And um, so one of the antidotes that Jesus talks about how to counter greed is to consider. The next thing he says is, verse 31, seek God's kingdom. Instead, seek his kingdom and these things will be added to you. Verse 31. So Jesus says to the antidote to covetousness and to the wrong definition of what life is, uh, firstly, you have to consider how valuable you are to God. Secondly, he says, Seek the kingdom of God. And what does that mean? Instead of being the, like the rich man, right? He says, uh, verse 18, I will do this. I will tear down my barns. I will build larger ones. I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. So instead of taking a posture, you know what? I'm going to gather. I'm going to hoard all I can. And then I'm going to consume it for myself. The parable of the rich wise man would have probably said this, you know, God, look at all these things that I've stored. I know that all of it comes from you. God, give me the wisdom on how to use all these blessings you've given me. God, I know that I'm blessed to be a blessing. So God, give me wisdom on how to use this for your kingdom. That would have been the end of the parable of the rich uh, wise men, right? Because he, to be rich and wise is to see your wealth, your possessions, not to be consumed by yourself, but to see it as tools for the kingdom of God. So what does it mean to seek the kingdom of God? So uh, one of it was, yes, you know, Ask God, God, all these possessions you've given me, all the things, my, my talents, my, my, my car, my, my, the things, my laptop, uh, how do I use it to serve you? you know, the money, how do I use it to serve you? you know, that's one of the ways that we can seek the kingdom of God. So you're building these resources and you are not to consume for yourself, but 
for it to be a blessing unto others. Um, you know, one of the principles of uh, the kingdom of God is reaping and sowing, right? So uh, what does it mean to seek God's kingdom? It means to apply the principles of God, the kingdom principles in every area of your life, whether it's your health, whether it's your relationships, whether it's your workplace. And I'm just going to give you uh, one of the many uh, principles of, of um, wealth that the Bible talks about. One of it is the reaping and sowing. You know, last year, around February, March, I went to Israel. You know, here's a picture of me, and right behind there, you can see uh, Jerusalem, or you can see the, the Temple Mount there, uh, the, the gold um, dome. Um, that's where uh, the Temple Mount is. It's, it's the most sacred, most holy place to the Jews, and, um, and also it's probably something like second most holy place for the Muslims. But, you know, I got to go there. All expense paid. Um, someone sponsored my, my flights. They sponsored my um, tuition fee uh, to go there. And I, I was blessed by this couple. And I have only met them once uh, before. Right, but man, they at the end of 2018, they reached someone reached out to me and said that hey, there's someone who wants to sponsor you to go to Israel, and you know how does this fit into reaping and sowing? Um, I've been wanting to go to Israel for many many years, you know, I, since my early 20s. You know, I know some of you are shocked when you say, since your early 20s, Pastor Balan, you only look 22. I know, but uh, I'm not, okay? But I've been wanting to go to Israel since my early 20s. And I remember this man who came to Kuching at the time to do a conference about Israel and end times. His name is Peter Sukahira. And he talked about Israel and invited the, the people at the conference to go to Israel. And I remember thinking, man, God, I would love to go, but I can't go, I can't afford it. And at that time, I was thinking, something uh, dropped in my heart and said, you know what? Reaping and sowing. God, I'm going to sow into this man's ministry knowing that one day you will bring me to Israel. And uh, 15 years later, right, someone sponsors me to go to Israel. You know, this is just one of the many principles in the kingdom of God when it comes to finances, reaping and sowing is one of it. You cannot reap what you do not sow. And, you know, I've done it for cars, right? I needed a car, so I would sow into someone else's life who needs a car. Uh, I've done it for mission trips. You know, I needed to go to on mission trips, so I sow into other people's life uh, so that I could go to mission trips. I, I don't know how it works. I really don't know. But all I know is it works. And you probably have people in your life group who have sown into other people's lives, sown into other people's ministry, and then somehow they get a return. I don't know how it works, but somehow it works. This is just one of the many financial wealth principles that the Bible has for us, that God has set into motion, like the law of gravity, right? Uh, sowing and reaping. So I just want to encourage you that God loves you. And when we... Seek His kingdom in all areas of your life, our life. When you seek His kingdom in, in your life, you know what will happen? Instead of just a career, you will have a calling. Instead of just becoming a consumer, you will become a creator. Right? You will uh, look at your job, you will look at your workplace, you look at your home, and, and you, will just, you will try to become an engineer, a, a an architect of how do I make my home, my workplace, my, my, my work um, more like, more godlike, more, more aligned to the kingdom's principles. God takes care of his children. Verse 32, he says, Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. That's how valuable you are to God. He is your 
Father. You are so valuable to Him because you are His child. And if you think you are a good parent, right, you will take care of your children. You will feed them the best. You, you will give them, you will provide for them the best. How much more our Heavenly Father will provide for you? More than that, we be able to recognize that we have not a wealth that can be affected by economy. We, we have a wealth that cannot be taken by thieves. We have an eternal wealth. You know, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, it says this, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. You have an inheritance that is eternal, that cannot be taken, that uh, it is imperishable, better than gold, better than all the things that we possess on earth. You have an inheritance that will last forever. And that makes you wealthy beyond your dreams. And that is what Jesus has provided for us. When He died on the cross, when we receive Him into our lives, when we say, Jesus, be my Lord and Savior, immediately it says here, we are born again into a living hope. You know, when you receive Jesus, what happens is you get access to this imperishable wealth that is in heaven. But only if you receive Jesus as your life, as your Lord and Savior. Because He has become the access to this wealth. And, he, and when we uh, walk with Jesus and we talk with Jesus and we allow Him to be Lord of our lives, we'll begin to walk not trying to get rich, but we recognize that we are rich. And that we can approach life, not with a sense of greed, not with a sense of hoard, hoarding, but we can approach life with a sense of uh, security, sense of generosity. Because we know that we are rich in Christ. You know, in that parable, the rich man dies suddenly. You know, Jesus is emphasizing the urgency of the times that we live in, that no one actually knows the length of their life, right? No one actually knows. Only God knows. And He's creating an urgency for all the listeners, and I want to create that urgency for you. Don't assume that you know how long you will live. Don't assume what's going to happen tomorrow. Because God has knocked on your door. God has reached out to you many, many ways, and you know it. He has spoken through friends and family. He has spoken to you through the quietness of your heart. And He has been telling you how much He loves you. And I believe today is the moment for you to respond to His love for you. Don't be like the rich fool. Don't assume that Man, you can consume and you'll continue living because we don't know. We really, really don't know. And that's how Jesus brings the story, of the parable of the rich fool. He says, tonight, God tells him, your soul will be required of you. So I want to encourage you, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, maybe you're walking through this life and you feel worried, you, you don't know what the future is going to bring and it makes you feel anxious and um, it's caused you to behave in ways that you wouldn't normally would because you're so anxious, you're so afraid, you're so in fear. So you would uh, do things, say things, uh, uh, participate in things that normally you wouldn't have done that. But because you acted in fear, uh, you did those things. Jesus has come to remove the worry and the anxiety that we have about our future. But only if you receive Him and you walk with Him and you ask Him to be the Lord of your life. So I want to give you the opportunity, to the, the opportunity this morning to respond to Jesus as He knocks on your life. Don't be like the rich fool. Don't be like the rich fool. 
You are so valuable to God that He gave His Son to redeem you, to pay for your soul. If you are a parent, you know how precious our, our children are. You know, we wouldn't trade our children for anything, and yet God traded His Son for you. That's how valuable you are. Your, your value is not determined by the amount of valuables you have. Your value is determined by the price someone would pay for you. And don't throw that gift away. That's how much G Jesus loves you. That's how much God loves you. Don't push Him away. Today, He's inviting you into a relationship with Him. And this relationship will give you a kind of peace. It will give you a kind of freedom that you cannot buy with gold. You cannot buy with um, worldly wealth. It's the only kind of peace, peace, only kind of freedom that exists in the world. Um, and it can only be bought. It can only be received when you receive the payment that God has given for you, and you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So this is the moment for you to release yourself from the worry and the anxiousness of the future. So that you, when you think about the future, you will consider how valuable you are to God, and you will see, and you will walk, and you will live life in the security that you are a child of God, and your Father will take care of your needs. And more than your needs, He will give you your wants as well. So don't miss this opportunity. If you don't identify yourself as a Christian, you don't call yourself a believer, you don't call yourself a follower of Christ, don't be like the rich fool. You, none of us know how much time we have. But today is your opportunity not to respond to God in fear, but to receive Him by considering how valuable you are to Him by knowing how valuable you are to Him. You are so valuable to God that He gave Jesus for you. So if you don't identify yourself as a Christian, you don't just call yourself a believer. Maybe someone shared this link with you, or maybe you are, you know, you've been to church before, but you don't have that intimate, personal relationship with God. You still walk your life in fear, um, but you would like to change that. I want to invite you to say a prayer with me. If you want to be a follower of Christ, if you want to be a, a Christian today and, and, and experience the freedom and the peace that comes with knowing how, who God is and walking in relationship with Him, knowing how much He loves you, if you want to experience that peace, that security, I want to invite you to say this prayer with me, okay? Um, so it's a very simple prayer. All you have to do is maybe you just open your hands out like that and uh, just bow your head and close your eyes and just follow after me. Father in heaven, today I heard this message and I just want to respond to you. God, I've walked my life without you. I've walked my life not knowing you. I've walked my life against your laws. But today, I want to change. I want to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Jesus, would you come into my life? Would you come into my heart? Be my Lord. Be my Master. I receive the payment you gave for me on the cross. And I believe that after three days, you rose again from the dead. Walk with me. Be my Lord from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. I just want to say, if you said that prayer for your first time, congratulations. Uh, this is the first step in seeing your life truly transform 
by God, by your Father in heaven. And if it was your first time to say that prayer, um, you know, after, the, after this, after this session, you can go to this web link, hgmd.la slash connect, okay? Uh, go to this web link and someone will be there um, to minister to you, to talk with you, to uh, explain further what that prayer means and what are the next steps that you can do. Um, and, you know, if you're here today, you're watching this and maybe you are a believer, but you have some anxiety. It could be about finance, it could be some other things. Maybe you need prayer for yourself or somebody else. Also go to hgmd.la slash connect, you know, and, and we have some prayer ministers there to uh, just pray for you and encourage you during this time. Thank you so much for being here today. It was such a blessing to bring the Word of God uh, to you. Uh, and um, let's continue to honor God and make disciples. Thank you, Pastor Balan, for the powerful word. You know, I've been blessed and I hope you have been too. For the offering today, we are going to look at 2 Corinthians 9, 7, which tells us that everyone should give as they have decided in their hearts, not out of reluctance or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. You know, we are in a season where we can give so many excuses to not be cheerful when giving. But I want to encourage us today as we give our offering to not focus on the negative circumstances, but to shift it and be cheerful for the things that the Lord has done and is doing all around us. Now, I have four quick announcements. First is this marriage enrichment session that we'll be having on the 25th of May. I believe this is going to be a very powerful session for all married couples. So do grab your spouse and sign up now at hgmd.la slash marriage. The following announcements as per usual will be kids, stay back for your awesome kids service at 11.30 a.m. For the teens, you have your Insta Live service later at 3 p.m. And for those of you who are Mandarin speaking, you have your Geng Sing service later at 4 p.m. And once again, we hope that you thoroughly enjoyed today's service. Continue to join us next week for our Once Upon a Time series. See you next weekend. God bless. I can finally go out. Ayo, <laughs> extended one more month. Oh. Yes, we are so glad Malaysia is in a better state now, but it has been extended for our safety. We are both wearing masks here because we want to remind you kids that if, even when we can go out when necessary, we have to wear our masks, wash our hands, and take care of our personal hygiene at all times. Yep, that's right. We just want to say that we are so proud of you during this MCO period, that you are so, so well behaved. So, to show you how well behaved you are, your parents have already sent us the video. So, let's see it.
That was a nice one, children. So proud of you. Now, it's time for us to stand on our feet and do praise and worship. Ready? Set, go! go. All the static, all the noise Can't compete with your beat Tuning in to your voice It's your love on repeat Shout it out, tell the world I have found a meaning Can't be quiet anymore You're the song I'm singing Can you hear, can you hear it? Through a million voices You're the sound all around Love is big, love is loud
Hello everybody and welcome to the quickest, speediest, fastest series we've ever done. Ready, set, go! I'm a bit sad today. <laughs> it's the last week. But it's okay. We have time today to unpack some more of Jesus' teaching. Do you still remember the fastest person isn't always the winner? When it comes to following Jesus, the winner is the one who listens and does what he says. That's right, kids. For the past few weeks, we have been talking about this great sermon that Jesus has shared on top of the mount. So, can you guess what is the name of the sermon that Jesus has actually shared? Yes, that's right. The sermon is actually called Sermon on the Mount. So today, we are going to talk another point that Jesus has shared during his sermon. So before we start, I'm going to try to act and you have to try to guess what I'm actually feeling. So are you ready? So let's try. So kids, can you guess what I'm actually feeling? If you have guessed, if I'm scared, I'm worried, or I'm anxious, you are correct. So, because all the, sometimes we do feel that we are anxious, and we are scared, or we are worried, but God actually said something in the Bible to tell us not to worry. So, before I share to you what God actually said, let's, let's look at the Bible to see what He says. So let's turn our chapter to Matthew 6, verse 25. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body. What you will put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. So what do you think Jesus said in the, in the verse? Jesus actually said, don't worry. But sometimes when the whole world turned upside down on you, it is not easy to not feel worry. So Jesus actually gave a few examples to, to why we should not worry. So the first example is God asked us to look up and look at the birds. Why? Because do you see that the birds actually do not worry about the food they eat? They don't need to go to the supermarket to buy their food. They do not need to cook their food. They do not need to go and store their food in the fridge because God has already provided them with all the food that they need. And then, God also, uh, then Jesus also gave another example, which are the wildflowers that is growing outside. Do you see them wearing any clothes or not? Like, like how we always wear clothes? No, because God and Jesus have already made everything beautiful so that they do not need to worry about them. So, kids, Jesus said that we do not need to worry about any other thing if we seek first the kingdom of God. So if we seek first the kingdom of God, God will provide everything that we will ever need. So kids, remember, seek first the kingdom of God. In our story today, Jesus taught us about how he cares for the birds in the sky and the flowers in the field. What more Jesus will care about us? Here I have my personal story to tell you about how God cared for me when I was diagnosed with cancer seven years ago. Um, when I first discovered I had cancer, the first feeling was denial or maybe just disbelief. Like, how can I get cancer? I'm, I'm very strong, I'm very fit, I'm very young, actually. Only older than you all are. Right, but uh, I I was really very healthy and I did not believe it. But of course, uh, after we did tests, it was true. I had breast cancer, and it was uh, stage almost stage three. So it was actually not considered early stage as well. Um, but I was not at all scared. I was maybe it hit me once that I might die. But I'm not afraid of dying because we, you know, we're all Christians and we 
we know we have a God and we know we're going to heaven. So I wasn't afraid of dying, but everyone around me was afraid that I would die, I would leave my children behind. I have three. Emma was two years old, uh, so she was very young. And so everyone was more scared than I was. But throughout my entire journey of treatment, of uh, going to hospital in and out, I was never really scared. I, I, I had a very good posture and I, I was always very positive. You can ask anyone. Nobody knew I had cancer except I didn't have hair. You know, uh, in the beginning I wore a wig, but after that I accepted that I didn't have hair and I just wore a scarf. And I was actually very pretty in that scarf. Okay. Um, so anyway, after my whole treatment, uh, there, it was maybe five months. It wasn't very long, but if you ask any cancer survivor, um, I had it really good. I did not really suffer through many side effects. Some side effects could be um, nausea, diarrhea. Chemo also makes you not, um, not have appetite and cannot sleep. But I could sleep, I could eat, I could actually do most things that a lot of people cannot do. And if you look at me now, nobody believes I had cancer before. And all this is because God cared for me, but of course, I, I did pray every day. Um, during chemo, during radiotherapy. In fact, even now, um, Teacher Monica is still under medication and I will be under medication for another four years. It's a very long time. But it is just medication. Um, I can still do everything I can do before. Isn't it amazing how God cared for me uh, during my situation? A lot of times when we start to worry, it's because we forget that, you know, we have a God who cares for us. If there's something that troubles you and you learn to pray and talk to God about it, it would slowly but surely uh, disappear. Your troubles will still be there, but you know you have a God that you can count on who will take care of things for you. How about you, Teacher Kenny? Um, for me, I think money for food, clothes, you know, driving to work, safety, family, yeah, you know. That's how God cares for Teacher Kenny. Um, nice one, Teacher Kenny. Children, I believe you also thought of a few, right? Let's look at the Bible to find another way to defeat worry. Don't worry about anything. No matter what happens, tell God about everything. Ask and pray and give thanks to Him. Philippians 4, 6. This verse tells us that when we get worried, we should tell God about it. We can ask Him for anything. God will take care of it for you. Oh, in fact, let's pray to God right now and give our worries over to Him. Shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you for reminding us that you care for us every day, even when we don't ask, even when we don't say. But we, Lord, well, Lord, we thank you that we know when we cast our worries to you, you will take care of it all. And we pray, Lord, for each and every one who is listening, that you will take care of all their worries for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Wow, Teacher Monica, that is such amazing testimony. Kids, don't you think so? Well, I'm sure very blessed by the testimony and also it's such a powerful reminder that Jesus cares for us. So I believe that you are very blessed with the sharing today and the Word of God. So we will see you next week. Children from Damansara and Puchong, see you all right after this at Kids Hangout. That's all for this week. Bye! Bye!